Hello and welcome to the first lecture from HCA 1002 Big History. Um, today what I'm going to do is talk to you about two elements of Big History to introduce you to the subject. First of all, I'm going to talk to you about a story and a story that's very interesting to me. The second part, I'm going to tell you about why that story matters and why I think it's a symbol of Big History and what we're going to try and do in this course. So let's start with the story first. In the late summer of 1977, two rockets left Earth for the outer solar system. Each rocket was carrying a small, fragile space probe, no bigger than an average uh, modern day car, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. They were meant to explore the outer planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, Uranus, and then to go out into the solar system. Over the next 13 years, these two probes explored through the outer planets, bringing back the most extraordinary data about our own solar system, our own nearest neighbours. Currently, those two probes are still going. In 2013, Voyager 1 left the sphere of our own sun and entered interstellar space, the first human-made object ever to leave our own neighbourhood. In 2019, Voyager 2, following a different trajectory and travelling slightly slower, also headed into interstellar space. Voyager 1 is currently travelling at 38,000 miles an hour. That is nearly 10 miles per second. Voyager 2 is travelling slower. It's only travelling at 35 thousand miles per hour. Voyager 1 is currently 13 and a half billion years from home. Voyager 2 is 11 and a half billion miles from home. Those two probes will never see their home planet again. Even at the speeds they are travelling it will take 40,000 years for them to reach the next nearest star. Neither of them are actually heading for our next nearest star, Proxima Centauri, but even if they were, it would take them 40,000 years, even at the speed they are travelling today. What is amazing is that those two probes are still sending information back to Earth. They have the power now, or less power, than the power that is used to light the fridge, the light in your fridge, and yet those two probes are still every hour pinging back information to Earth. They will die. Probably within the next five years both of those little probes will run out of power and they will die and they will continue on into the depths of interstellar space, silent. But they still have a voice. And this is what I want to talk to you about because both of those probes have attached to their outer casing a record. The so-called golden record because of its colour. Before those probes left in 1977 they were each fitted with a curated record of our planet and of our civilizations. As they head off into the depths of interstellar space into a vacuum, they will just simply keep going. There's nothing to stop them. They may last for billions of years, unless they happen to hit, by some random chance, a space rock. But space is a very, 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 very big place. Or, if they encounter other life. And the idea behind the Golden Record was twofold. One, to provide an image of our planet to ourselves, to think about ourselves and what we would want to send out into space, but also to provide a record of our planet if by some miraculously, infinitesimally small chance, those two tiny probes, remember the size of a regular car, 
were to be found by another life form. Let's just imagine for a moment that they are found maybe a billion years into the future. And just imagine that the aliens, who must be either um, somewhere around the technology of the late 1970s, or are perhaps complete retro hipsters and know how to work a stylus and a vinyl record player, and they put the record on, what would they hear? This is the first thing they would hear on that record. They would hear a human voice speaking in English, but in heavily accented Austrian German. And it would, they would hear this. As the Secretary General of the United Nations, an organisation of the 147 member states who represent almost all the human inhabitants of the planet Earth, I send greetings on behalf of the people of the planet. We step out of our solar system into the universe, seeking only peace and friendship, to teach if we are called upon, to be taught if we are fortunate. We know full well that our planet and all its inhabitants are but a small part of the immense universe that surrounds us, and it is with humility and hope that we take this step. That was the voice of Kurt Waldheim, the fourth Secretary General of the United States. It's one of the ironies of history, one of the ironies of human history, that Waldheim, years later, became clear to people that Waldheim had, as an Austrian-German of the late 1930s and early 1940s, as of course, served in the German army during the Second World War as a counterintelligence officer, and almost clearly had been involved, not directly, but indirectly in a unit that had summarily shot and executed partisans in the Balkans. I think in that moment, Waldheim maybe finds an act of self-forgiveness in humility and hope. He reaches out to whoever is out there and tries to prevent, present the best of humanity, while also knowing in his heart maybe some of the worst of humanity is there as well, an extraordinary figure. What is on this golden record? What would the aliens see? Well, we'll be putting up some videos and some more information so you can see this. But after Waldheim is speaking, we hear in 55 languages of the world greetings to the aliens. From languages from ancient Greek, through English, through French, all the European languages, down to tiny languages spoken by only a few hundred people in Micronesia or in parts of South America. We then get 12 minutes of the sounds of the earth. Sounds from the rain and thunderstorms, through to people walking through the snow, to the sounds of cars, of workmen, of rockets taking off, jumbo jets flying through the air. And then 90 minutes of music. The first piece of music the aliens would hear after the sounds finish is the glorious sublime opening of Johann Sebastian Bach's second Brandenburg concerto, a joyous piece of music telling, I think, that of 1977, that these, the people who curated the Golden Record thought that the first thing the aliens need to hear was the glorious sublime product of the European Christian Enlightenment. But let's not be too critical of them, because what's the next bit of music? The next piece of music is a sacred piece of music from Java. The next piece of music is some amazing singing by folk musicians from Mali in North Africa. The next piece of music is, is, is a wonderful piece of music from the rainforests of Benin in sub-Saharan Africa. The fourth piece of music is traditional singing by Australian Aboriginal peoples. This is an attempt not to represent Europe and North America and that world as, as the only thing. This is a genuine attempt to represent a global community. Yes, it's a global community as understood in 1977 but significant. The Golden Record was not the first attempt by humans to, to communicate with aliens. An earlier probe, Pioneer 10, had carried a, a plaque that represented uh, two human figures on it and various information about where to find us in the universe, our relationship to other stars and other uh, visible objects in the sky. But these two figures on the Pioneer 10 plaque, Pioneer 10 plaque had been very obviously Caucasian, European, North American white people. And it had been controversial as a result. 
The Golden Record was a genuine attempt to try and represent a world culture. The only really aspect of music that is not represented, ironically, is, is, is perhaps one of, one of the 20th century's great contributions to music. Rock and roll, popular music. The only single piece on there to represent that entire rich canon of music is a song that to you now will appear like ancient history, but at the time was still very much one of the great iconic pieces of, of, of modern rock and roll. Uh, Chuck Berry's uh, Johnny Be Good from 1958. But even that is an extraordinary piece because the Beatles had wanted to be on it apparently, but they couldn't secure copyright to their own music at the time. They'd wanted to put up a Here Comes the Sun. I, I sort of wonder whether that might have been partly because Lennon and McCartney were annoyed that a George Harrison song would represent the Beatles, not a Lennon and McCartney song, but that's another matter. Johnny Be Good though is extraordinary because in a time of Black Lives Matters today, in 1977 they chose a song by an African American an African-American song that captures some of the spirit of the, the history of, of popular music. The Delta Blues, the music of the Deep South of America, and behind that, the rhythms of songs of slavery from the American South. And behind that again is a distant echo, the music of Africa. The pi the Voyager Golden Records are important in so many ways, but we need to remember that they are what will survive of us. The two Voyager probes are the farthest thing from planet Earth, and they are the farthest thing from planet Earth that there ever will be. Other probes may travel with them, but they are so far ahead and travelling so fast now. They are the forefront, they are the genuine pioneers of humanity and they will what they is what will survive because eventually in the next few billion years the sun will swell it will destroy our planet humans will probably long be extinct but our planet will be swallowed by the sun and disappear but those two voyager probes will still be going kurt waldheim will still be talking johann sebastian bach and all the other musicians will still be playing those people will still be walking through the snow with their footsteps and somewhere in deep space, Chuck Berry will still be singing Johnny Be Good. And that's something for us to think about. Hey.